The Hitachi DA-1000. What is it? Who built it? What is it made of? And what is its purpose? Short answer, aliens. This is the Hitachi DA-1000 compact disc player from 1983. It hit the market only a year after the launch of the CD itself in 1982. And I'll give you two guesses as to who was responsible for their development. They were initially created to store and play digital sound recordings. It's a single-sided acrylic disc that's pressed just like a record, then topped with aluminum reflective coating and frosted with a lacquer on the top. The lacquer is the layer that gets the label, just like misspelling your name on the top of a birthday cake when you're nine years old. When Hitachi launched the DA-1000, they were already manufacturing a vast number of OEM products for other companies. Everything from small basic components to fully digital DAC chips were being developed, built, and sold by Hitachi in-house, and that was significant. If you remember from the Grundig Beat Boy video, it was very common practice for electronics companies, well, okay, companies in general, to go to a bulk OEM manufacturer and buy a generic product and just slap their own case and label on it and call it a day because it was cheaper and easier than having to spend copious amounts of money on R&D for a product that already exists, especially if it's a product they're not specialized in. And that's totally fine. Nobody expects indie t-shirt companies to sell their own shirts when they can buy them from Hanes. It's the same idea. Building parts for other companies has kind of been Hitachi's thing since their inception, at least to some degree. When they were founded, all the way back in 1910, they were manufacturing electric motors for mining equipment. So since they had the ability to make their own parts from scratch, it was sort of natural that they ended up jumping in and building their own CD player with in-house components. The reason that's significant is because when a new media format appears, which is as groundbreaking as the CD was, you need to capture that market as soon as possible. The problem is a lot of companies were so far behind Philips and Sony that it was too costly and time consuming to develop a reliable CD player that could make any impact on the market relative to their size. Their solution was to turn to Hitachi for an OEM framework so they could get something out there. And rather than develop a whole separate unit for OEM sale, Hitachi, basically just took the guts out of their own machine and sold them to other companies. JVC, Denon, Brandt, and several others put out clones of the DA-1000, but Hitachi's is the OG. So now that we've gone over where this machine came from, let's take a look at it. First of all is the overall look of it. It screams 80s, doesn't it? Actually, with that red line in the front, it looks like something the Empire would have made in Star Wars. Return of the Jedi came out the same year. Coincidence? Unlike most stereo components, the DA-1000 is only 12 and a half inches wide, so it's really compact. The display on the left has really cool styling. The two most important readouts, the track number and the time, are displayed in the center. They use the term programs here. The top shows a progressive location indicator which shows the total percentage of the disc that's played, broken into five minute increments. And the bottom has a volume indicator for the built-in quarter inch headphone jack. The display uses incandescent bulbs, LEDs, and VFDs all at the same time. My favorite bit is the way the CD loads. When you hit the open button, the center slowly opens up and reveals the slot for the CD. You place the CD in the door and hit the button again and it draws the disc in as it closes in one smooth motion. Beautiful. And as it plays, you can actually see the disc spinning. This unit actually demonstrates something interesting about compact disc that is inherently different from any other form of audio media up to this point. As the disc plays, you'll notice that it slows down. That's because it reads from the center outward. Since the circumference is constantly increasing, they were able to fit a lot more data onto the disc by making it slow down. It keeps the plastic moving past the laser at the same speed no matter how far it is from the center. Physics. The right side has all the playback controls. Interestingly, the large printed panels act as the buttons themselves, which click when you press on them. The play button is the largest at the top, with the fast forward and reverse buttons set inside the play button. Below that is the stop button, with the pause and memory stop buttons similarly inset. At the bottom is the open and close control and the headphone jack. Next to the CD door is a column of program controls. These allow you to select a specific track on the disc and start with that rather than starting at the beginning and skipping forward to it. You can also program a playlist of tracks on the disc and have them play in that order if you want to skip certain tracks automatically. This is probably more useful for compilation CDs. Then of course, there's the repeat function which has its own indicator on the display. Because this machine is a first generation unit, it does have a few odd quirks. You have to be deliberate when you use the controls. If you try to skip tracks too quickly, it won't respond. You have to hit skip, wait for the next song to play, then hit skip again. That's likely why they added the program function. It's much faster. 
Now this particular unit has one problem. The volume controls don't work, so it's stuck at four, which is really too bad because the way those work is actually a really odd choice. Rather than have the computer control the volume directly, the buttons move a small motor that turns a potentiometer that controls the volume, which to me is an odd choice. I wish mine worked. Fortunately, that only affects the headphone jack because you have the option to use a line level output on the back which overrides the volume control. Since some of you are voyeuristic, let's get a quick peek of the unit with the cover off. They really packed everything in here nicely. The motor that spins the disc is exposed and similar to a hard drive platter. I'm sure that's not an accident. The laser assembly is really large compared to modern players. This whole piece moves back and forth. Fuses are down here, covered by a piece of thin plastic. And in the back is a giant transformer that didn't quite fit, so they had to install a little blister on the back. And look, I think that's the volume control motor. Maybe I'll get that working one of these days if I can figure out how. Suggestions are welcome. Screwy volume aside, I like this thing. I suppose that's obvious since I use it as my CD player in my house. What's really nice about it is it actually plays burned CDs. I've encountered more than one vintage CD player that struggles with burned discs, especially ones that were made on those old copier machines that were part of your hi-fi before we did everything on computers. I actually still have a few of those laying around, and they actually played. And the other thing that surprises me is how much I could bump it without it skipping. It took a lot of jiggling to get it to skip. I actually had to pick it up and shake it a little bit, which obviously you should never do. That leads me to my final thought, though. I didn't pay much for this CD player, and even though I find it to be a beautiful piece of 80s design, and I don't want to wreck it, the low cost of secondhand stuff like this means it's okay to screw around with it. If you want to learn how this stuff works or try fixing it, do it. There's nothing wrong with going to the Goodwill and picking up a couple of secondhand things and just pulling them apart to see how they work. You don't have to be an engineer with years of training. Of course, that helps, but there are so many great tutorials online that you can have a go at it yourself. It's not expensive to try it, and if you fail, that's okay. Try again. Get another one. Thrift stores get half broken stuff all the time that you can screw around with. It's fun. Don't let people gatekeep learning new skills. That is stupid. Remember, the worst thing that happens is you break it and you get another one. Who cares? It didn't really work right anyway. What's the difference? Don't be afraid to try. You might actually find out that you're good at it. I'll see you next time. Stay metal.